Hi, my name's Ian, and this is part two of, uh, of my ramble about King Arthur. Um, what I did with the ramble is, uh, is I found a convenient cut-off point for the part one. The whole thing was recorded in one fell swoop, so it's a, a total ramble. That cut-off point ends with uh, effectively <clears throat> uh, saying that, that uh, historical Arthur has been overtaken by a a superheroic literary figure, um, and going up that sort of um, that theme then picks up in this video, as you'll see, uh, by exploring that side of things. So, what I wanted to do is to start off this video to give it an introduction rather than just picking up halfway through the conversation as I did first. First, um, I'm cutting out a tangent that I went on uh, regarding the Anglo Saxon Chronicles, but I, want, I would like to summarise that tangent in saying that, like with uh, other historical documents of the time, like with Gildas um, the, and, and as with Bede, the, there is no mention of Arthur, even though you have Vortigern and everything else, but there is no mention of Arthur in those historical documents. Uh, and the, the second thing is to mention <clears throat> a couple of documentaries and documentary series that you would if you're interested in the historicity of the Arthurian, so-called Arthurian period, or the Dark Age period of Britain, and uh, and what it was really like, uh, and you know the, the the potential for Arthur being a, a true figure or not, or the stories about Arthur being a true or not, uh, then there's two. Uh, two documentaries that I can suggest. I think you can find them on YouTube. I won't link them in the description here because I'm not sure about the legalities of the um, the YouTube the, the the uploadings on YouTube that that people have done. But I'll leave that for you to go and um, do your own searches on. Uh, one is uh, King Arthur's Britain: The Truth, which is a BBC documentary from 19. Uh, sorry, from 2018, um, that Professor Alice Roberts goes and explores that. Uh, she focuses around Tintagel, but also goes off um, onto the archaeology of other sites that uh, are associated with the period, um, if not Arthur and the Arthur tales directly. Uh, and the other, which I do bring up, uh, I do mention in this, um, in this particular part, uh, another is... Um, Britain AD, um, which was Britain AD, which was a documentary for Channel Four that Francis Pryor, an archaeologist, uh, put together, and also released a book um, that goes into more detail than the documentary has. But the documentary is very accessible as well, uh, and that was from two thousand and four. Uh, and the two are the two are very compatible the, the the some of the ideas that they have uh, that they put forward and, and some of the archaeological evidence and so on that they yeah, they use um, has has parallels and overlaps so they, they do the two do work quite well uh, hand in hand so that's 2004's Britain AD and 2018's King Arthur's Britain the truth and earth um, two very good documentaries um, that I would recommend anyone interested in the Dark Ages historical period of Britain um, go and have a look for and a, a watch of um, and pick the book up if you want to delve deeper into into the you know if you like reading references and and looking at dig things anyway we'll get on with part two um, and uh, and see where we go from there. So yeah. So in part two, uh, I'll just develop the rambling about Arthur being a literary superhero, uh, and then let's uh, let's uh, reach some conclusions, which I think I've just spoiled. But never mind. So see on the flip side. So we all got all of that. What do we got? What we got? Were the next one down the line. Um, which I guess is where Arthur has now come completely off the rails, right? So let's assume that that way back in Gildas, when he was talking about um, about roughly a, a contemporary, maybe just under a century 
uh, past the events of what's going on. You've got Gildas talking about Ambrosius Aurelianus at Mons Badonicus. And now we've got uh, contemporary chronologies, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles and stuff going, we're not even going to mention these things. Uh, and you've got Nennius going on about uh, Arthur went and did this and all of this other stuff that he could not have possibly done because it's just too far uh, spread out in uh, in history. Now along comes this dude, right? So, um, Geoffrey of Monmouth. This this is where I think the Arthur that we know today starts, right? Um, Monmouth is basically an entire fabri uh, fabrication. He takes some of the things from earlier works, particularly uh, the uh, Annals Cambriae and from Nennius, uh, and then throws in all sorts of bloody weird stuff according to according to uh, monmouth arthur managed to forge out this huge empire uh, of which obviously there's no archaeological or historical evidence um fought against the roman empire itself uh, had a um united all of the people of, of britain and uh, and all this kind of stuff but it's it's where we get uh, most of the things that we know today, or that have received today, about the storyline of Arthur. Well, Monmouth starts off with all of the this, the stuff about Brutus and uh, and Troy and all of that. How <coughs> how um, the the people came to Britain and and uh, all of that pretty much nonsense. Um, but you know. It, it, it is what it is. I mean, right, I'm going to tear this apart a little bit. Um, but, as a book, it's a fantastic read. I'll say that, it's fun. Uh, but in, in, uh, in the lines of, of uh, historical worth, it's, it's, it's no more a history book than is The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe. Um... It's basically an illustration of where, where you know, Nennius may have been departing from history and then Monmouth completely goes off the rails with it. So it starts off with all of the stuff about, um, about the founding of Britain by Brutus. Uh, then we have... Um, <coughs> uh, oh, that's all about that. Then we've got um, Merlin. I mean, Merlin turns up in a few earlier works, but here he's actually doing his proper thing, uh, doing his stuff, um, does a lot about uh, Merlin with Vot again, helps him. Um, then you've got Uther, turns on that, you've got all of the, uh, the, the stuff with the the dragons, I mean Uther's vision of the dragons, uh, whereby he then becomes known as Uther Pendragon. Uh, then you've got all of this stuff where it all starts getting a bit... Um, a bit non-PG, where you've got Uther going, now oh, that, that, uh, Igerna in this case, um, so Uther goes to, uh, to, to go and hook up with him, and uh, Uther sees uh, Gorloi's wife, Igerna, who becomes Igraine in later works, and, uh, and then Uther goes, well, you know, I, I kind of fancy her, and, uh, and that's what she does, <laughs> so, so off goes Uther to go and uh, and do things with Tintagel um, to try and and take Igerna, uh, and then Uther turns around to Merlin. But Merlin was summoned immediately when he appeared in the king's presence. He was. And you eventually she falls pregnant with Arthur, but then you've got like the death of uh, the death of. Um, of Uther, um, which is uh, no, once the Saxons had had been defeated, and in some cases there, there's oh, in some of the earlier bits and pieces when they're going about um, about Vortigern, 
that's how he died too so uh, by, by being poisoned so whether Uther in Monmouth is actually an amalgamation of Vortigern and this guy that's come from somewhere else which is Uther um, so then after that you've got uh, the, the uh, as soon as the death of the king became known the bishops of the land came with their clergy and bore his body to the monastery of Ambrius and buried it with royal honours at the side of Aurelius Ambrosius. So even Monmouth doesn't uh, forget our friend Aurelius Ambrosius. Uh, but then, then we get this thing about um, about um, the, the eventual fight with Mordred. So Mordred and his army were driven before Arthur's lot. The big fights. <clears throat> the Perdra, which is uh, Mordred, reformed his army and marched to Winchester. Um, Guinevere gave way to display, uh, despair and fled. And then, when he had lost so many of his hundreds of fellow soldiers, Arthur got really cross, buried the dead and marched to Winchester to lay siege uh, to his nephew. There you go. Um, Mordred was his nephew in this particular thing. Uh, so, uh, no mention of incestuous? I, I can't remember. So, a big old sort of fights and everything else, and then uh, eventually you've got uh, this last bit of Arthur in there. Uh, while the two commanders, Arthur and Mordred, were encouraging their men in, the way, uh, in this way, in both armies, the lines of battle suddenly met. Combat was joined. And they all strove with might and main to deal with each other as many blows as possible. It is heartrending to describe what slaughter was inflicted on both sides. The dying groaned, and how great was the fury of those attacking. Everywhere men were receiving wounds themselves or inflicting them, dying or dealing out death. In the end, when they had passed much of the day in this way, Arthur, with single division, in which he had posted 6,666 men, charged at the squadron where he knew Mordred was. They hacked away through with their swords, and Arthur continued to advance, inflicting terrible slaughter as he went. It was at this point that the accursed traitor, Mordred, was killed, and many thousands of his men with him. However, the others did not take to flight simply because Mordred was dead. They massed together from all over the battlefield, and did their utmost to stand their ground with all of the courage at their command. The battle, which was now joined between them, was fiercer than ever, for almost all of the leaders on both sides were present, and rushed into the fight at the head of their troops. On Mordred's side fell Tarek, Alaf, Ecbricht, and Bruning, all of them Saxons, the Irishmen Gelapatric, Gelasel, and Gelavis, and the Scots and the Picts, with nearly everyone in command of them. On Arthur's side there died Odbricht, king of Norway, Asiel, king of Denmark, Cador Limenek and Cassie Valornus, as well as many thousands of the king's troops, some of them Britons, others from the various peoples that he had brought with him. Arthur himself, our renowned king, was mortally wounded, and he was carried off to the Isle of Avalon, so that his wounds might be attended to. He handed his crown of Britain over to his cousin Constantine, the son of Cador, Duke of Cornwall, and this was in the year 542. So about a hundred years after the Romans disappeared. So that, that, that sort of you know illustrates the things, the period that I'm talking about. You've got 443, which is the groans of the Britons, and then 542, which is where, um, where Monmouth is giving the death of Arthur. So in that century, there are, there's quite a few, and there's some of the history books go um, in, in 450, something like that, 450, 460, uh, you've got this happened and then there was a period of peace. And it, and then that peace then collapsed and then eventually the Anglo-Saxons took over. And it, it is within that gap, that sort of almost a century gap, where we start getting people filling things in. Most inventive of all uh, was Geoffrey of Monmouth. So that's kind of where Monmouth comes in. And that to me is the foundation of what we then get so everything before now uh, before then before monmouth was preamble and sort of building up 
Arthur as a, a superheroic figure. And then in Monmouth, he becomes that superheroic figure. He leaves the realm of potential historicity and enters the realm of pure fiction. Okay, it's not about Monmouth. I, I, I urge anyone interested in Arthur to read Monmouth as a starting point. Um, brief mention, I've got to cover other brief mentions. Uh, the Mabinogin delves in a lot into Arthur, uh, but again, the Mabinogin was much later. Um, when, when did it start? It's, uh, yeah, so you got like 12th century. Um, the, the White Book and the Red Book, around about the 12th century, written by Christians um, going back and having a look at the wealth mythology. Uh, and the Arthur stuff to me is a bit... No, oh, I don't like it. Um, the stuff, you know, the, um, covering like Puig and Rhiannon and uh, and Arun and all of this kind of stuff, that to me is... Uh, and Math Mathonby. That to me is the is the heart of the Mabinogian. And then when it starts going on about Arthur and, and the tales of Arthur and... But... It, it starts getting a bit, um, it, it, it's, it's, I think what they did is they picked up on the Annals Cambriae, which were already based on the earlier stuff, probably Nennius, and then trying to sort of build a narrative from that. And I think that the Mabinogian, rather than, than tell the mythology of, of Wales, it's actually much in the same way as that some of the um, the Snorri does with the Edda. Uh, what it, what it is is a, a Christians and the Book of Kells as well from the from an Irish uh, religious uh, Irish mythology perspective. They they are looking back at these old tales, many of them in oral traditions, that are the mytholo mythology of a land that is now predominantly Christian um, and then trying to put those tales into a Christian context and because Arthur is is not a pagan figure very much from even from the earliest points a Christian figure he's born out of the uh, the uh, Christianized population of Britain Christianized through Roman Roman rule uh, and even in those early things, he's portrayed as a, 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 and even if we go back to Ambrosius or Rhianus, he's a Christian figure that is leading a Christian population against a, um, a pagan invader. Um, and so a lot of the, you know, the Arthurian pointers in the Mabinogian, again, it's Christian writers trying to put into context um, pagan mythology. And it's, it doesn't quite work. That being said, Mabinogian is one of my favourite books ever. It is, it's, it's, a nice, it's a nice little read. But I, I, I bring up the Mabinogian because there's a lot of Arthurian stuff in there. Um, or there's a lot of bits and pieces of, of Arthur in there. Uh, mainly as a sort of figure around which, um, around which other things happen. And then you've got things like uh, Excalibur. Or well, the concept of Excalibur sort of, sort of starts in the Mabinogian. Um, Guinevere is is a Welsh name, and and whatever it's um, but it, it, it's a good it's a good book. Uh, just as a just an aside, um, if you're into Jutsuurden, uh, and you ever wonder where the the perhaps unfamiliar spelling of Guinevere comes from, as in Jutz funny extra dimensional panther companion um it, it's the welsh version of it uh, so those of us that were brought up with all of that looked at the name in the dritz books and went oh guinevere uh, and those of us those of you that um, were american maybe i don't know i <laughs> i don't know tell me in the comments as as an american reading the dritz books uh, when you came across uh, across the name of uh, dritz panther companion did you did you immediately go eh, that's Guinevere or did you immediately go what the hell is this <laughs> I'd say it's um anyway 
Uh, what else have we got? Uh, the Life of Merlin. That's another one that's, that's an interesting read. It's by Monmouth, uh, but it delves a bit more into uh, Merlin himself. Um, that's uh, rather than the the uh, Historia Regnum. Um, yeah, so Vita Vita Merlini, or the Life of of Merlin. Uh, and again, Merlin's another figure that uh, is connected with Welsh, Welsh mythology, whether whether written in to Welsh mythology via uh, Monmouth or whatever unknown tales that Monmouth was drawing upon, of which Nennius is is obviously one. I, I think there was a branch, so you've probably got a foundation of a bunch of stuff that we don't know about, and there's going to be more texts than just Nennius that have been lost. Uh, that are then fed into, you know, branched out. So on one branch you've got Monmouth, whatever, and you've got another branch that that ends up with uh, further down the line with um, with the Mabinogian. You know, one branch where you got through, you got a bunch of of stuff down the bottom in which we can include Gildas and Nennius, and then up here we've got Monmouth through to Clethian de Troy, and up there we've got um, we've got the Historia Cambriae. Um, and then the the Mabinogian, it's it's sort of that's how I kind of see it in my head anyway. Uh, so speaking of which, what are, what's the what's next? What's next? Um, we've got uh, uh, Roland the Brute. That's um, that's a, a a poem that then goes and it, it's effectively a poetical rendition of Monmouth that goes and fills in some of the gaps. It's in Roman de Brut. The reason why that's important to say that is that in Roman de Brut you have got um it's where we get Excalibur. So in in the Welsh stuff and in Monmouth you you've got um uh, what have you got? You've got uh Calibernus or Calafwich and then that evolves into Excalibur within the Roman de Brut. It's also, the Roman de Brut is where we get the round table from, or at least it's where we 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 have mentioned a surviving mention, or the earliest surviving mention of the round table. The round table is not in Monmouth. Uh, then we've got, um, following on to that, we've got Chrétien de Troy. So, imagine this, right? So imagine this, uh, let's put it into the Marvel context again, or or the comic book context, and the timing magazines, all of this kind of stuff, right? So imagine this, you have a, uh, a couple of people back in the day, in the 1930s and 1940s, they, they come up with, uh, with Superman and Batman and Captain America and all of these early superheroes. Uh, and they go, look, oh, this, like, these details are really popular. And then following on from that you end up with people going oh this superhero like this is pretty cool and then you end up with the flash and wonder woman and the x-men and and everything else as people sort of add into that this is sort of what happened with um with with arthur so you've got people going oh we like all of these tales of of fighting fighting kings and knights and doing stuff and carving out the stuff and, and whatever uh, so a lot of people started writing a lot of stories um medieval romances and it, this, this is in the 12th century so it's like Monmouth made these things accessible and popular uh, <coughs> and you know other works like the Romance Brute um, waste and then off that exploded into all sorts of things uh, so one of the things that uh, Chrétien de Troy does he writes a bunch of stuff uh, that that he ties in with uh, Arthurian mythology, but it's from Chrétien that we get things like uh, Lancelot and Lancelot's sort of um, his his eye for the Guinevere and and all of that side of things. And this ties into this sort of one of the popular things at the time, one of the popular subjects at the time, was the idea of courtly love, uh, which may seem a bit alien to us. But the, the, the idea of courtly love is that you can love someone from afar and you can have a sort of um, uh, a, a uh, love affair without ever having, you know, a, a love, 
if you imagine what Lancelot was doing, effectively Guinevere was not effectively Guinevere married to married to King Arthur. Uh, Lancelot loved Guinevere. Guinevere loved Lancelot. So they're having this whole sort of mental affair or whatever uh, behind Arthur's back, but without actually consummating it or doing anything further than that. Now, obviously, later tales then added in the consummation bit, and uh, uh, but in the, in the romances, in those medieval courtly love romances. Um, the, the Mills and Boone of the time, if you like, that whole idea of, of courtly love was was very much seen as, you know, it's a it's a very graceful thing. It's a very you know very good thing to do. So Lancelot wasn't painted out to be the bad guy in all of this. He was painted out to being, you know, engaged in this courtly love, which was you know a fantastic thing. So, so Christian de Troy um, wrote or compiled or retold or, or what have you a number of those uh, sort of courtly love type episodes uh, and a few other bits and pieces he, he did a lot on the grail and that's why we get uh, the grail suddenly being introduced into all of this uh, mix of Arthur so in Monmouth uh, there's no grail uh, it's basically Arthur just going around forming this huge empire um, and then we get in uh, in Chrétien some of the more fantastic elements of the Arthurian mythology and the Grail quest start uh, start to creep up in uh, and, and there we go so Corinthians to Troy I mean we're completely left the track of historicity now we are now into the bounds of popular fiction of the day um, and then that's sort of built upon Corinthians to Troy is one and then we get a load of uh, of other people um, creating more superheroes and adding them in so the number of knights that Arthur is involved in or that are associated with Arthur's court grows and grows and grows and grows and grows there's a massive massive list of, uh, of various knights that go through basically it's uh, imagine imagine the Avengers so you've got the Avengers and it starts off with I don't know how many were in the original Avengers five or six something like that superheroes in the Avengers uh, and then you write another character and you think, Ooh, oh, no, this character would be really cool if he was in the Avengers too. And, and you get another character and, oh, she was going to be in the Avengers and so on. And now, uh, at, at some point, if you look at the list of um, of Avengers from 1963 or something when it first started, the number of, of superheroes that were in the Avengers to the number of the superheroes now that are associated with the Avengers it's like, you know, people invent a, a new superhero and think they're, they're really cool and have got a really good backstory to them and everything else. And then it's like, oh, and it'd be really great if they also got added to the roster of Avengers. So the list of Avengers nowadays is massive. Not movie Avengers, I mean the comic book Avengers. It's, it's like huge. Uh, and Avengers back in the day was really small. And it's the same, same kind of thing happens here. So in Monmouth, the number of knights that are associated with Arthur is, is you know... It's, uh, it's um, not hugely long uh, compared to the number of knights that, that eventually get associated with the round table through um, through Cretien de Troy and the, the later works. It just expands out. So people write these, these romances and those romantic poems and everything else. We end up with uh, the Vulgate cycle, which expands on the whole Lancelot and Grail stories, amongst others. Uh, and then the post-Vulgate cycle, which expands them even more. Uh, and then ultimately we end up with, or through all of this, these medieval side of things, uh, we end up with um, Mallory. Now, to me, uh, Mallory is the sort of, um, the ultimate foundation of the literary Arthur. So where we have gone through from Monmouth, so we've got Nennius going off the going off the beaten track of, of history and ending up going down a path that is towards a, a fiction, towards a um, a more sort of speculative type of, of thing, and Arthur starting to become a superheroic figure in mythology. Uh, we've got Monmouth who definitely nails it into uh, into that kind of form. Um, then we've got Chrétien de Troyes and everyone else uh, bringing all of these these various poems and, and everything else together and bringing them into a an, an Arthurian sort of growing and expanding canon uh, of you know, Arthur and the Avengers type of stuff. And then that is nailed down and compiled 
and put into something that is more or less um, uh, coherent, although there are some bits of it that are a bit uh, not coherent, but we end up with Mallory, and I think um, I think this is is effectively, if you're going to do an Arthurian story now, uh, you, you start here. Um, uh, no, uh, okay, if you're going to do a, a, a a, well, you could start at any point. You could you could start with Monmouth and then go from there. But you would omit if you're if you're going for Monmouth, you would omit Lancelot. You would omit the Grail. You would omit <coughs> all of these bits and pieces that we uh, understand as being part of the Arthurian canon. The Grail is now part of the Arthurian canon. Lancelot is now part of the Arthurian canon. So I think if you went to see an Arthurian movie and there wasn't a Lancelot in it, you would be going where. Um, so, yeah, it's here you would start. Whether you go backwards from here and introduce elements of Mallory and then Cretiana, whatever, into a, a Monmouth basis, or whether you end up with some speculative version of Arthur, like in the 2004-ish movie, um, The King Arthur. Ah, uh, Sarmation. Okay, so it's a Sarmation night. Okay, there we go. Um, <clears throat> fifth century, the declining Roman Empire is withdrawing from Britannia, and the native Wodes, <laughs> Picts, okay, uh, and Britons, led by Merlin, stationed in insurgency, a group of Sarmatian knights and their half British Roman commander, Artorius Castus, known as Arthur, have fulfilled their duties to Rome and are preparing to return home. Uh, but then they drag him in and everything else. Right, okay. So it, uh, so it's a speculation on the art. It's, a, it's taking Arthur into a different um, a different direction. But because you've got that, I mean, you've got, in that, you have Lancelot, Tristan, Gawain, Galahad, all of these these figures that um, have been introduced into the into the stories from all over the place. You know, Lancelot doesn't turn up until Clotilde de Troy. Or, well... Yeah, it is not codified into Arthurian uh, the Arthurian tales until Curtin of the Troy. So, so although that that particular film is trying to put Arthur into a historical context, and it, yeah, it's a reasonable enough film. Um, it's a whole mishmash of 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 bits and pieces. But even that it acknowledges that you can't have an Arthur movie without Lancelot. So there we go. Anyway, so so Mallory is the sort of starting point of. Uh, your your biblical, not your biblical. That's wrong. Your Arthur Bible. Mallory is your Arthur Arthur Bible. Then, if you go down the into the nineteen fifties, so uh, so Mallory is fifteenth century, fifteenth century. Forward uh, forward a, a few hundred years, you end up with T. H. White, Once and Future King. Um, that's a reasonably good read. Uh, it doesn't finish properly. It sort of cuts off before Arthur dies. Uh, it is there were four books. It was originally published in four books. Um, yeah, the, the Sword in the Stone, which you know everyone knows from the Disney movie, uh, the Queen of Air and Darkness, the Ill Made Knight, and the Candle in the Wind, um, which everyone knows from an Elton John song. But uh, and there was a fifth book that was written. And uh, but it was never included in the compilation, and then when the compilation was going to be put together, uh, White sort of scattered some bits of and pieces from that fifth book throughout it. But it it was um, yeah, it's 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 a bit of a romp, uh, and probably was uh, at the time the probably best one to go and pick up and and make a Disney cartoon out of. But yeah, the once and future king, which is how we know Arthur. Um, he will apparently return to save us all from Avalon, um, but having now gone through some of the governments, sort of, you know, how desperate does it need to get before Arthur comes back? Uh, yeah, oh, well, no, there we go. That's our own, that's uh, our own British particular messianic um, legend. And then we end up with. Yeah, you know, where we started with um, with Blanche Winder's stories of King Arthur, which, as I said, is a uh, a reduction in Mallory, a, a reduction and a sanitisation of Mallory suitable 
for a PG audience. So, some interesting bits, uh, just three, three books that I would like to just mention a bit. Uh, I'll go through, uh, let's go through them in chronological order of their publishing. And then I can kind of comment a little bit on, uh, on where they go right and where they go wrong and why they're interesting to read. So the first one is John Morris, The Age of Arthur. Uh, it is quite uh, some reading. Um, what it does is it it does go through some uh, historical elements of uh, of Arthur and some um, what can be gleaned of of history and so on. But it also starts going into the empire of Arthur and trying to place it and everything else. The unfortunate thing that this book makes is he starts from an assumption that Monmouth was right um, within certain parameters. So he, he takes Monmouth and tries to place a lot of what Monmouth says in a historical context and goes and has a hunt for, for those things. So this in itself makes this work fictional. And it's a fictional analysis. It's not intended to be fictional. However, I think it's great. Um, it's great if you are going to build a foundation of, um, of an Arthurian-like setting for gaming, or if you are doing, if you are wanting to do a bit more research into uh, speculative Arthur, Arthurian age that may not have existed or may have um, may have had a potential in another alternate universe or whatever you know um, if you want to write an Arthur comic book I think that is a fantastic resource as a histor history book no it's written like a history book it was intended as a history book it's intended as a historical analysis but the foundations from which it was written are ill-conceived so there we go the, the Age of Arthur by John Morris um, good book to read, fun book to read, got some good stuff in it, but unfortunately, flawed foundation. The next book is uh, is this, The Keys to Avalon, the true location of Arthur's kingdom and legend. Now this is, a uh, <coughs> we've got Steve Blake and Scott Lloyd, they do a lot of work. Now look, a bit of hex paper and there's a bookmark in this there we go uh, now I've I've used this book as uh, as foundations for bits and pieces of some of the scaling and some of the bits um, for bits and pieces of my own uh, particular world uh, however this then what this postulates what this book postulates is that uh, Monmouth was working from a set of documents uh, that are very fragmentary and that, um, that what he was trying to do was to make sense of them so he made some bits and pieces it up and uh, but there is some truth in Monmouth but what they go is they go well what we've done is actually we've gone and we've gone and discovered some of these these things and they, there's these these texts that are specifically these Welsh texts um, that actually describe some of the bits where you know we, we by comparing what Monmouth says with these other texts, we know that Monmouth went off in this direction, but with these original texts that say this is over here. So actually there is this, there is, uh, you know, Camelot can almost be found, the boundaries of Camelot can be almost be found across the border of, uh, uh, between Wales and England, and this is like that. 1973, uh, I'm assuming that, uh, that most of what, uh, or that at least the foundation for Monmouth is correct, so I'm going to try and explain it in historical terms. Um, <coughs> Keys to Avalon 2000, we've discovered all these other Welsh texts and everything else and, and we believe that, that they describe this real place and we can uh, are going out to find it. And there's some good things, you know, there's some, there's some maps where they start going, well we think this is referencing this and we think this is referencing that and, and look how this sort of matches this and everything else. Um, however, uh, by and large, if you actually go and read the critiques from this book, 
what it appears they have done is uh, is these ancient manuscripts that they think they have uh, discovered uh, appear to be Welsh translations of Monmouth um, that they have then taken as Welsh manuscripts that predate Monmouth that Monmouth may have used to to build here, but in other it's actually the other way round, uh, and they are Welsh texts that draw on Monmouth and put things into a Welsh context. So again, it's a really good read. It's a really interesting interesting book, and and again, if you want to try and use a a, a foundation for an Arthurian type, an Arthurian feeling setting or, or whatever and you want to see the analysis that they've broken down and the way that they've they've looked at things really interesting in that point of view unfortunately again flawed analysis uh, or a flawed foundation to their analysis works the works good unfortunately the foundation is is not not so good but the keys to avalon it's a it's a it's a good read uh it's a good read and unfortunately and again a flawed context Finally, um, is uh, is Francis Pryor. Now, this is Britain A.D. He also wrote another book um, called Britain B.C. Uh, the two, I think, should be taken in context with each other and should be read as uh, Volume One and Volume Two as a as a saga. Uh, it's <coughs> it's uh, as Francis Pryor is an archaeologist. He um, had a lot to do with. Flag Fen, which is an archaeological site near Peterborough, um, and it appeared on Time Team. A, a, a Time Team is a, an archaeological program, um, sort of making light entertainment of, uh, of archaeology. Uh, but it, it, it's good, and it's uh, it, it's one of those that got a lot of people in interested in archaeology, and uh, and actually looking at history with a more analytical eye and um yeah no no it, it's good and and these books themselves um francis Pryor does write from um a, a very good analytical perspective in my mind oh and oh, and also the both britain bc and britain ad uh, have companion television series to them uh, where you know, if you, I, I think that's always good. Um, if someone's actually done a a series uh, where they can uh, they can explain some of the things that they're talking about in the books in a more visual way as well. So, I, you know, different people learn in different ways. Um, uh, there, some people learn more by doing. Some people learn more by reading. Some people learn more by being shown. Uh, for for me, I am a uh, a learner, a doing learner and a showing learner, uh, but I enjoy reading. I enjoy reading, but then don't always... I find the best way for me to learn from reading is actually to read something and then put it into my own words. Like, like game mechanics. One of, the, re one of the, the ways that I learn game mechanics is by reading the books that are there and then going forward to, to write uh, write those rules out you know e even if it's for the purpose of giving players a summary of those rules uh, and by thinking through how to present the rules in a in a way that players would understand them you know actually you know, slimming them down and so on so they don't have all of the game master referees type stuff involved in there uh, and by organizing the bits of rules that that are needed to depict whatever setting that i am using um, by doing that, I have to. You, you have to learn, understand the rules to write them down again, or to rewrite them. And if you're doing that, then uh, that's one of the ways in which I I learn a new game. I take the rules, write a, a player supplement or whatever from those rules, and by doing that, get to understand the rules because I get to reference them and put them in my own words and. and and get to uh, get to know them a bit better. So, um, yeah. The, uh, anyway, so the, to the fact that Britain AD and Britain BC both have television series uh, associated with them, uh, and then that's that's all good and funky dory. And um, yeah, so definitely go and have a look. The, the, from Channel Four. So I think 
I seem to remember being able to find them on YouTube at one point. Um, they may be on all four if you live on in Britain. You might be able to find them under the documentaries there. But uh, so yes, so Francis Pryor is actually working from uh, from uh, archaeology rather than um, history. And as we know, history written by people that often have a um, an agenda. Uh, often history is written by the victors. So can we always rely on history books to tell us the, the true thing? But if you take archaeology, which is the material um, remains of things, and take that in concert with the history and analyse the two and see where they correlate, then you perhaps come up with a more accurate picture of what was going on. So this has been a bit of a <coughs> bit of a trip, and uh, and there are plenty. If you want a shorter sort of summary of all of the Arthurian stuff, there are there are quite a few out there that I can. Uh, um, I might link to in uh, in the description just to sort of say here are some less rambly things and and less <laughs> and less randomly picking passages out of various history works and and reading through. Um, but I'll, I'll summarise <clears throat> I'll summarise a few things. It's like uh, first off, uh, Arthur is a historical figure. My own personal thoughts on that is that there was someone, um, there was an Ambrosius Aurelianus who did some stuff. He is one of many figures that did many things uh, that later historians, writers, whatever, then started to form um, a, a legendary superhero and about. So the historicity of Arthur as we know him uh, with all of the trappings that were from the later stories, uh, is just basically uh, just a non-starter non for me. Um, I think he had some foundation in history, I think, really early on, in the 9th century, uh, <coughs> or even before, he he leaves the, uh, the idea of being a historical figure and starts to enter the... Um, the road or starts to take the road of being a superhero and a medieval superhero so what's the worth of reading all of these bits and pieces i think it's just a great story uh, i think even even if you go back to <coughs> some of those early ones like gildas and nennius and so on i mean nennius uh, nennius doesn't take long to read at all it's a really small book um and it's it's just it's just fun. It just gives you a sense of the time and how people were writing at the time. Some of them are a bit of a slog. If you're not particularly religious, I'm not particularly. I, I'm interested in religion and mythology, uh, but I'm I'm not particularly religious myself. Um, if you go through from that point of view, it's it's an interesting um, sociology um, study as to see how religion develops in a, a quite a concentrated area so if you think of the British Isles it's not the largest area on uh, on earth um, and yet it's been affected by so many different things <clears throat> and and has gone through so many different um, religious and philosophical um, uh, trans more trans transformations uh, so you start off you know you start off with with whatever, um, whatever Mesolithic or Neolithic type worship that they were following when they erected things like Stonehenge and other stone circles uh, through to the Celtic ideas of spirituality and the Druids and so on um, through to the Christianization through to different forms of Christianity in you know, Celtic Christianity and Roman Christianity, <clears throat> through to the the Germanic um, gods uh, or Germanic religions. I mean, you you can see this in the mix of the English language itself, where we have uh, Roman the Roman calendar. Uh, you know, Janus January um, through you know o October. No, October's the eighth month. But who've you got before that? You've got. Juno, June, so you've got the Roman gods, <coughs> who were themselves based on the Greek gods, 
where you've got that going on through our the names of the months of our calendar and the names of our weeks you've got thursday thor's day you've got uh, wednesday Woden's day you've got frigga um, represented in friday you so you've got these germanic um gods represented or germanic and scandinavian gods represented in our weeks uh, you have these greek and roman gods represented in our months so even that is a is a mix and then you know it's going through that sort of germanic religion uh, side of things to once again becoming uh, becoming christianized with that uh, the, the synod of whitby i think was that that perspective then the synod of whitby actually came about during the christianization of the anglo-saxons rather than the uh, the the roman christianization of the britons yeah the, the the study of this side of things in the stories shows you that mixture of elements that make up our british identity um, we are so so much a, a potpourri of of uh, of if, well, I mean, it continues to this day. I was going to say a potpourri of European um, mixtures, uh, but then it goes even further than that because you know, with the with the expansion of the British Empire, um, you know, the, the number of cultures that are encompassed by the word British is now just uh, just immense. <clears throat> um, you know, as people have moved in as various countries then gained independence the populations were given the option to to come here to assimilate themselves into into britain themselves so you know we, we've got elements i think we always have had elements from all over the place uh, and that that concept of the british isles being a whole potpourri mixture of cultures and the meetings of cultures uh, continues and, and long may it do so i think it's uh, it's fantastic um, it gives us a very except in certain quarters obviously but it, it gives us a very different view of the world um to countries that are more um more singular in the in the cultures that they they represent uh, so from that that perspective yeah, I, from a from a, a a sociological and then whatever I can't pronounce that today uh, and a um, a philosophical yeah I think it's, it's reached us to the point where we are very much a an encompassing society on the whole <clears throat> and um, yeah and from the stories themselves I mean the foundation that we have with King Arthur and other other mythologies and uh, that we have in people like robin hood and everything and that that gives us um that gives us something of a an identity a, a matter of of britain as it's uh, as it's called this whole sort of origin story whether it is real or fictional um gives us a, a at least some semblance of of what could be termed as a as a british identity and i think that's right i i think that um that sort of stoic, stalwart, push forward type attitude that we we tend to um, be presented with, I think that comes from King Arthur. That sort of you know push forward, uh, regardless of the odds. That's uh, that's our King Arthurian nature, and our general rebelliousness and uh, and attempting to do uh, what we feel is right. Um, regardless of the potential legalities of it, uh, I think that comes from from uh, from Robin Hood. Um, so, yeah. So from those, it's just that is what King Arthur means to a Brit, and uh, not all Brits have have actually read through all of these. Uh, a lot of British people these days will be getting their uh, the King Arthur hit, if you like, from uh, from movies. I haven't gone into movies so much uh, because some of them are just bloody awful. And I think that's the level that Arthur has gone. He's, he's now a global figure. So uh, in my comments at the start about cultural appropriation and stuff like that, I think uh, Arthur, 
global figure, was already head, heading towards a global figure within the, the, the French um, uh, the French medieval romances, that, you know, Chrétien de Troyes and all of that. Um, and people recognise him as that, and you know everyone has made variants of, of King Arthur, uh, and it's great the different ideas that they get poured into that character, and you know we shouldn't um, we shouldn't worry so much about people taking ideas from different cultures and using them and incorporating themselves, because we do not come together as a species by isolating ourselves and saying. We can't do X, Y, and Z because um, that culture over there has an absolute monopoly on it. Uh, so yes, that's my thoughts. Right, so that's my thoughts ahead of King Arthur, and I've rambled on a fair bit about King Arthur. Three batteries worth of camera time. Um, it's probably going to be a hugely long video. Um, I promise that the review of Pendragon is probably not going to be as long because uh, we'll be dealing with the game and the particular take that it has on the Arthurian mythology. Uh, but I just wanted to do this particular video ahead of that one so that some of the commentary that I might make about around Pendragon has a context in my own understanding of Arthur, what he means to me, Arthurian history, and Arthurian literature, uh, and so how that works. And obviously, you know, Pendragon's written by Greg Stafford, uh, and he has his own take on it that he portrays in the game. Um, that, uh, you know, but, but you'll see when we get to that video, you'll see how the two may or may not marry up, or where they do marry up and where they don't. Um, yeah, so there you go. What I didn't want is this particular ramble, and, and or me going rambling on about uh, about Arthur and my own thoughts on Arthur in the middle of a review for a game, because then that would detract from the review of the game. So instead, what you've got is this particular ramble about King Arthur here, and then we can deal with the, the game as itself, and not have me going off on a tangent, going, oh, but Arthur is... No, no, no. Right. Okay, so that's it for today, and uh, and hopefully you uh, you will pick up on the review of the Pendragon game uh, going later. Uh, that might not be the next video because um, the next video may be a brief review or review or whatever impromptu review or something of this particular game, which is based on the Black Hack, uh, which is the Black Sword Hack which I think has got some really neat ideas uh, and that's particularly, I mean, the black sword hack. You can probably tell. And me being a Moorcock fan, uh, there are some definite Moorcock elements in here that I think make this a really fun game, but also I think could be brought into other games um, as concepts and uh, news there. Anyway, that's it for now, and I will see you in the next video.